Good morning. We are in 2 Timothy. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9 of chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. This is Paul's last letter. And he's written to encourage his son in the faith, Timothy, to get into the fight. Timothy's discouraged. So Paul writes, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Jannes and Jambres' folly was also. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do that. We come Second Timothy 3 begins with an ominous statement. Paul tells Timothy, hard times are coming. That's the meaning of in the last days difficult times or hard times will come. Now to me, hard times is the 1930s and the Great Depression. When I was young, my father would tell me stories about his experience growing up in those days of the electricity being cut off, of having only beans to eat. It is stories of people being homeless and hungry in soup lines. It's John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, poor farmers leaving the Dust Bowl, taking Route 66 west to California, only to discover that it wasn't the land of milk and honey. Those were hard times. But Paul has something far more difficult in mind than that. He was referring to a spiritual famine and waste that will test people's faith and ravage the flock of God. That's the future, he said. It is in the last days that these difficult times will come. All through the Bible, the last days refers to the time of spiritual and moral collapse just before Christ returns. Timothy was already in hard times. Wolves were ravaging the flock in Ephesus and across Asia. He was worn down by it. And Paul was reminding him that that is the nature of things. By making this apocalyptic statement about the last days, Paul was giving Timothy a reality check. Realize this, he was saying. Things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Time is moving toward a great apostasy. Paul was telling him to understand the present by understanding the future. This is life. It's a spiritual war, and it won't change until the end. Calvin called this a forewarning intended to increase Timothy's diligence still more, telling him to to prepare for the struggle that still awaited him. 
In verses 2 through 5, Paul gives a list of vices that will characterize the last days. There are 19 alone listed in verses 2 through 4. It's not necessary to deal with each in detail. They are self-evident. A comparison between the first and last description in verses 2 and 4 is very instructive. Men will be lovers of self rather than lovers of God. That's the root of the problem. When Christ summed up the law of God in two commandments, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But that will be turned upside down. Men will replace love for God with love of self, and the result will be moral and spiritual chaos. All of the things that Paul describes here. Godlessness results in selfishness and dangerous times. That is the idea in this word difficult. It's used in Matthew 8, verse 28, of the two men in the Gadarenes who were demon-possessed, and the way the word is translated there is violent. They were wild men. And that's a good illustration. When men turn away from God and turn to self, they become like beasts, and the world becomes a savage place. Dostoevsky uh, made that point in his novel, The Brothers Karamazov. It's about a father and four sons, four brothers. And they're all different, and one of them, Ivan, is an atheist. And he's like some of these today, an evangelical atheist. He was promoting it. And in that book, he makes a famous statement that you often hear quoted. Without God, everything is permitted. There's no heaven. There's no judgment to come. No basis for right and wrong. So anything goes. That was his philosophy. He spoke it to people. And, and he happened in all of that, to persuade one of the characters in the book. I'm going to try not to give it away because you may want to read the book, and I recommend it. But one of them is persuaded by what he said, and he acted upon it and committed a heinous crime. And when he confessed his crime to Ivan and explained what he did, Ivan is appalled, and he, how could you have done that? And he explained, well, I could do it because... You told me there's no God, and when there's no God, everything is permitted. At that moment, it's just so he has an epiphany. It dawns on him that this is the real consequence of atheism, and he's horrified and went mad. No one can live with atheism. The logic of it is everything is permitted. Now, that is a world without boundaries. That is a world without hope. That's a world without morality. It is a world that becomes a living hell. Now, there really, it seems to me, and I think this is, I think this is correct, in spite of all of the uh, evangelical um, atheists that we are seeing in the past five, ten years, there are really not a lot of theoretical atheists, people who don't believe God exists. There are some, I know, but I read a review of a book a week or two ago by a philosopher, and she explains everything materially, everything that happens in you, your decisions, your emotions, your anxieties, whatever is chemically explained, just chemical reactions. Well, that's the logic of a materialistic universe, of, of a universe without God. There are people like that, but that itself, I think the reviewer was saying, would not be very popular or well-received, and it isn't. There are not a lot of theoretical atheists, but there are a lot of practical atheists. That is, people who live as though there is no God. And that's what Paul is describing here. Men who ignore God, who don't include Him in their thoughts and plans, they are a law to themselves. They're like that refrain in the book of Judges, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. They live for themselves, and everything is permitted for them, not for you, but for them. 
Now that's the world of the future. What Paul describes here of the last days when men will be, first of all, lovers of self. Well, just like they are today. Men today worship themselves. Self is the center of everything. What will happen is happening now. Really, it happens in every generation. That's human nature. But it will get worse. And only Christ will win the victory when he returns. But we need to brace ourselves for a long struggle and not let up. It's what Paul is really telling Timothy to do here. Again, the hard times that Paul describes as coming and already being here is not poverty, it's not famine, it's not war, it's wickedness, it's personal depravity. And it all flows out of self-centeredness. When people love self, they worship what will get them the things that they want. They worship mammon. They worship money. That's what Paul says next. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money. Then verse 4, lovers of pleasure. Selfish people become pleasure seekers. And money is the means of obtaining the things that give pleasure. And so that's what they pursue. They pursue relentlessly money, and sometimes they pursue it savagely. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, Paul calls called the love of money a root of all evil or a root of all sorts of evil. Now, he's not saying there that money is evil. It is not. It can be and often is a tool for good. We all need money. We need it to support ourselves, to provide the, the necessities of life. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with making a lot of money. The Bible doesn't condemn that. Pleasure is not bad. The Bible doesn't condemn that. It do, does not promote austerity, or a, probably a better way of putting it is it does not promote asceticism, which is a spirituality through self-denial. The Bible does promote discipline, self-discipline, but not this sense of I'm going to be spiritual by, by denying myself all the good things of life. That's just the opposite of the, of the correct perspective in the spiritual life as Paul presents it. God's creation is good and it is to be enjoyed with thankfulness. And Paul states that in, in 1 Timothy 4 verse 4. No, the problem is not money and the problem is not pleasure. It is loving those things and pursuing them as the priority of life. The problem in all of this really is misguided love, improper priority. Self-love and materialism destroy moral values and produce antisocial behavior. Paul says men will be boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful. Five expressions that, that describe a breakdown in human relationships and particularly within the family. The remaining expressions are broader than that. Man will be unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, Without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Most of these, as I said, are self-explanatory. The word treacherous is used of Judas in Luke chapter 6 and verse 16, and it means traitor. And due to self-love, a man will become a traitor to his friends, to his family, to his wife, to his children. He is reckless. He stops at nothing to reach his own ends. Now that's human nature apart from God's grace. That's universally true, but it was especially relevant to the false teachers, which are really the main subject of this whole passage. Paul goes on to describe these men who are lovers of self rather than lovers of God, as men who are religious. In verse 5, he states that they hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. 
all of this stuff he describes here goes on beneath the surface or it goes on beneath a veneer of religion. Rarely, even in a secular age in which we live, well, maybe it's becoming less so, but rarely do people deny religion. They hold to some form of it, but only to its form. And the form is, as someone said, an empty shell. It has no power, and I think that's a good description. Shells can be beautiful. People like to go to the beach and collect them. They have uh, fascinating forms and nice color, but they don't move. There's no life in them. Well, that's religion. That's what he's speaking of here. There, there is a form, and there may even be some beauty that to many people in religion. There's lots of ceremony, lots of color and pageantry, and that is a, a beautiful thing to many people. They're drawn to that, but there's no life in it. It's possible for people to come to church participate and be unsaved, to sing the doxology as we do at the beginning, to recite the Apostles', Apostles Creed, as many churches at least used to do, sing Amazing Grace. People love to sing Amazing Grace. I've seen rock stars singing Amazing Grace, some seriously, some mockingly, but you can sing any hymn there is and sing it with gusto, but do it all without faith. That takes place within a church. It's possible to be in a church, it's possible to be in Believer's Chapel and be lost. To have a form of godliness, but not the power. To have religion without morals, to have faith without works, which is not genuine faith. That's clear from their lives, described here in these 19 expressions. And the gospel is the only thing that can change them. It's the only thing that is the solution to the problem because it's the only medicine of the soul. It doesn't offer a list of virtues in place of these vices. It doesn't say do this and do this and do this and do this. I'll give you 19 good things to do. No, it goes to the root of the problem, which is unbelief. That's the root of all sin, and it deals with that. It changes that. That is the power of the gospel, as Paul describes it in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It's the reason he can say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel, broadly speaking, the gospel is the entire Bible, because from beginning to end, it's all about salvation and grace. Even the law is really about that, because it's teaching people the need of grace. So broadly speaking, the gospel, the good news, is the Bible, not just the narrow proclamation of the gospel as we give it. And it is living. It is unique. It produces change when it is taught or proclaimed because the Holy Spirit is present with it and causes it to be effective. You can read a lot of good literature. I've said this before. You can read Homer. You can read Shakespeare. You can read Dostoevsky. You can read all kinds of good books and good literature that have been produced and be edified by them and, and see things from a good perspective and be given great uh, understanding. Shakespeare has a great understanding of human nature. I don't think he understood the solution. But you can learn a lot. But you will not have the Spirit of God in that as he is in this book. This is unique of all books. This is the book that the Spirit of God uses to effect change. It is the book and the message God uses, the Spirit of God uses to plant the seed of life within the soul of His people. It is the book that He uses effectively to change. And it brings about change with regenerating power so that people understand and believe. Suddenly they have ears to hear. They're changed and they can understand things that before were foolishness to them. And that radical change which occurs in human nature does bring about 
a fundamental change in the individual, a, a change in thinking and behavior, inwardly and outwardly, so that people then do behave differently. They, ha they have a new nature, and they have within them the Holy Spirit who produces what Paul calls in Galatians chapter 5, and verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. Nine virtues that are the opposite of these 19 vices. But the false teachers denied that. They rejected the gospel for a form of religion, for ceremonialism, legalism, religion of various kinds and shapes. But in every case, it is empty and powerless. In the future, in the last days, that will only increase. What's going on now, it's typical of fallen human nature and typical of false teachers who infiltrate churches. Everything Paul describes here of the last days is relevant for today. And so he now applies it to Timothy. As one of the commentators, J.N.D. Kelly, wrote, the setting of apocalyptic prediction is now completely abandoned. Paul has set the stage to say, in effect, it, this is the way it's going to be at the end, very bad, and it's that way now. Not to that degree, but this is the trajectory. This is the arc of, 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 of history. It's moving toward that, and so you can expect it now. And so having made that clear to Timothy, he tells Timothy what to do now in the present. He warns him to avoid such men as these, these false teachers. Turn yourself away from them is the idea. And it's really a strong command that implies that Timothy was to avoid them with horror. Now, I don't think he means he was to avoid contact with sinners. Uh, Christ never avoided sinners, and if Timothy were to avoid them, he would have to go out of the world. That's what Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5. Paul's referring to the false teachers here. Now, I don't think he means don't have any discussion with them, don't correct them, don't warn them. He was to do that, but he was not to give them any fellowship, receive them as an equal, give them any official recognition, they, they were to be put under discipline. They were to be dealt with as they were, false teachers. And Paul explains the reason why in verse 6, such men, he said, are dangerous, they are predators, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women. These are predators. That was their strategy. They, they targeted women who stayed at home while their husbands were away at work, and they would work their way into their houses. It may have been um, some of the wealthier houses that they entered, because uh, in the Greek text, the statement is, the houses, not just any houses, but the houses, suggesting that they might have been prominent homes. And that would be consistent with what has been said of these kinds of people. That they have a love of money. So they would try to gain women's loyalty for their financial support. And they're very effective in doing that. They had a very, very effective method. They, they, were, they were like um, a person who sneaks in. The word enter means creep in or worm their way into homes. I remember Dr. Johnson spoke of the creepers. I don't remember if it was this passage, but that's a good description of these men. They're creepers. So their intentions were not obvious. They're not going to let on what they're up to, to to gain financial support. They were hidden behind a facade of religion. And really, who, who is more trustworthy? And who's more caring than a man of the cloth? Who has more integrity than, than a, a religious person? And that's the facade that they had. And that naivety allowed these men to win the women's trust. I, I think Paul must have had uh, specific people in mind. He wasn't suggesting that this was typical of women. He was explaining the method of these men in, in Luke. Uh, or rather in the book of Acts, Luke uh, recorded that in Thessalonica, many of the leading women 
of that city were persuaded of the gospel and followed Paul and Silas. They weren't like these women that he's describing here. It's the same in Philippi. You remember in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas go down to the river where they knew there was a meeting, and it was a meeting of women. They were having a prayer meeting. There weren't enough people, not enough men to form a synagogue. And so the women met, and they had this prayer meeting, and Paul gets up and speaks the gospel. And in verse 14, Luke wrote that the, the Spirit of God opened Lydia's heart to receive the things that Paul had spoken. And not only she, but these other women believed the gospel. They were not deceived. And that became the basis of the church in Philippi, the first church in Europe. Priscilla, Aquila's wife, would not have been taken in by these, these charlatans because she knew God's word. She was able to reason according to scripture and, and, and was therefore wise and discerning. The women taken captive here are the opposite. Paul calls them weak women. And the Greek word is actually a diminutive form and it means little women what it means is little in character. They were weighed down with sins or literally heaped up with sins. They had many sins and, and their shame and their guilt were a burden to them. Guilt is a crushing burden. These men knew they could gain influence over them by telling them the things that, that would be a kind of palliative, uh, a kind of spiritual sedative that would give them relief from their guilt. It wouldn't remove their guilt, it would only mask their guilt, but they could make them feel better about things. Maybe they did that by denying the seriousness of sin, reassuring them that there's no reason to feel guilty or worry about the, the sin or judgment on it. God is love after all. Well, that's true. That is true. God is love. It's one of the great statements of the Bible, but he's also a, 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 a just God as well. But that's just the way a false teacher would deal with things, give a half-truth. They told them whatever they wanted to hear. Guilt makes people gullible. So they'll listen to what they want to hear, and the result is they are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They have no discernment. They're, they're like the people that Paul describes in Ephesians 4, verse 14, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men. And so they got taken. They got fleeced by these ancient tricksters who believed what one of America's greatest con men, P.T. Barnum, said, there's a sucker born every minute. And Paul knew from experience that there were predators out there. There were predators in here, in the church. He understood that. Not believers, but men posing as believers with this veneer of religion who wanted to capture the naive and the undiscerning with their false teaching. The only thing that prevents naivety and gives stability, our only foundation and compass is Scripture. That's true for all, male and female. Without it, without the Lord, everything is permitted. So people who are not reconciled to God, who are in their sins and, and weighed down by them, lack discernment and are driven about by the latest fad or theory and they fall victim to the trickery of men. Now some are more vulnerable to the tricks of these men than others, but really all of us are vulnerable because false teachers are often clever, often know the Bible, and, and seem sincere. John Stott didn't call the, these men con men. He called these men door-to-door -door religious salesmen. Now, if you're a salesman, that may be a bit unfair. I was a salesman once, one summer. 
But I learned some tricks or methods in sales that if you follow these methods and these ways of doing things, I got a week of training, well, you can sell someone something that they weren't even thinking about buying and maybe don't even want to buy. But you can lead them in a certain way and overcome objections, and pretty soon you've got them signing this order form. I wasn't very good at it, but I knew that it worked. And so there are men who are really quite good at doing that. I've been on the receiving end of it, I will say that. About 10, 20 years ago, I went up to Oklahoma City to visit Mike Black, and he said, well, let's go to this new Christian bookstore. I want you to meet the manager, Bob. Bob, okay. We go in, it's large, and it's very full of, uh, it's a lot of activity. There's Bob over there with a book, and we said, Bob, this is Dan. Hello, Bob. He puts a book in my hand. This is a very good book. Spurgeon loved this book. He said of this man, and he gives me this accolade, and I thought, I've never heard of this book. I've never seen this book. So I have this book in my hand, and a few minutes later, I've got three or four books in my hand. I walked out with a stack of books. I thought, what am I going to do with these books? I got them home and put them in a drawer. They're still there. <laughs> I went back six months later. Let's go see Bob. And I said, Bob, oh, Bob, okay. I am going to make a comeback. I'm going to resist his salesmanship. 30 minutes later, I've got a stack of books, <laughs> and I wonder, what happened? So I said, let's not visit Bob again until we get to heaven. And so, <laughs> well, that's why these false teachers are so dangerous. Bob wasn't one of them, by the way. He's a good, good man. But they were dangerous because they are so good at what they do. They're salesmen. And so what Timothy needed to do was expose them and oppose them and give them no quarter, no fellowship. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're selling snake oil, not real medicine. Yeah, well, there's nothing new in any of this. There's nothing new under the sun. What will happen in the future is happening in the present, in the present and it has happened in the past. In verses 8 and 9, Paul gives an example of these false teachers and the ultimate futility of their activity from the Egyptian magicians who opposed Moses, Jannes and Jambres. Their names are not mentioned in the Bible. If you go back to Exodus, you won't find Jannes and Jambres. You'll find those magicians, but we don't have their names. They're found in one of the Jewish Targums, which were paraphrases and interpretive translations of the Bible. So this is information that was passed on by tradition, and Paul believed it was reliable. Their names were well known. The fact that, that Paul chose magicians to illustrate the false teachers may suggest that they use magic to authenticate themselves. It's, it's not unlikely uh, in light of Acts chapter 8 and Simon Magus who did wonders and people were amazed at what Simon Magus could do. He wasn't a believer. The false teachers that Paul had in mind may have been like that. They, they may have claimed to have healing powers like false teachers do today, like those who fleece the naive and, and uh, take advantage, take the money from the uh, vulnerable, play upon their vulnerabilities and weaknesses. And for that reason, Paul may have compared them with magicians. But certainly, he made the comparison because they were frauds who opposed the truth. These were the magicians in Pharaoh's court who, when Moses threw down Aaron's rod and it became a snake, they threw down their rods and they became snakes. And of course, the immediate reaction is, well... The priests of Pharaoh are every bit as great as the priests of Yahweh. Pharaoh is as strong as Yahweh. And then, of course, you know, Aaron's rod swallowed up their snakes. But they continued to oppose Moses with what Exodus 7 verse 11 calls their secret arts, their trickery, which only prolonged in the will of God and the plan of God the plagues and wrecked Egypt. They did no good. They opposed God's truth and His work of salvation to their own destruction. 
And these false teachers were just like that. They uh, opposed the truth of salvation in Christ, and that proved that they were outside the faith. In fact, Paul's very strong here. Rejected is what he calls them. For all of their claims of having truth and their form of godliness, it was all a pretense and it was pagan. They're no different from Jannies and Jamborees, Egyptian sorcerers. That happened in the past. That happened in Moses' day. It will happen in the future. The last days we will see an increase in opposition and deception. Christ warned of that in Matthew 24, verse 24, in the Olivet Discourse. He warned of the coming of false Christs and false prophets who will do great signs and wonders. In fact, the text says that, it, it, and, and, uh, that if it's possible, they would deceive even the elect. It's not possible because we have the Spirit of God that protects us. We're sealed with Him unto the day of redemption. But were it possible... That would happen, which is a way of saying they'll be very effective in their, their deceit and their ability to mislead. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 9 and 10 that the Antichrist will be revealed with all power and signs and false wonders. Revelation 13 speaks of the beast and the false prophet doing great signs that lead people into false worship. That's the future. It was the past. And so we can expect it in the present. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. We will always have hard times. We face a very clever and effective enemy. The enemy is relentless, but the enemy will not succeed. They will experience some success in, in capturing people. They do, but... For all of their success, Paul assures Timothy in verse 9, they will ultimately fail. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Jannes and Jambres' folly was also. Just as Jannes and Jambres failed to match the power of Moses, and that proved them to be frauds, humiliated them every time so too the false teachers will be exposed. We, um, we naturally get distressed over the advance of false teaching when men deny the deity of Christ, deny His incarnation and His resurrection, deny His future coming. That, that bothers us. It should. it should. It should vex our soul. We're disturbed by these celebrity preachers who make false promises about prosperity and health and they defraud people and they live hypocritical and wealthy lives. It makes a mockery of Christianity before the world. That's what the world thinks that the church is. These, seem, these things seem to be only increasing while Bible teach, teaching seems to be decreasing and the evangelical church is growing weaker. That's discouraging. But the encouragement is that false teachers are never allowed to get away with it. God is sovereign. And God is patient. He allows spiritual error to advance, but only so far. It's Proverbs 26, verse 27. He who digs a pit will fall into it. That's what Paul was telling Timothy and what he needed to hear the encouragement that he needed to hear, that we are not losing, we will prevail. He needed to hear that these men are just like Jannies and Jambres. They could compete, but only for so long and not very long. And the history of the church testifies to that. It is littered with the wreckage of false ministries and false ministers who have been caught in their own schemes and and self-destruct. God knows what's happening. He's in control. And he is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. That's a promise. And that's how the last days will end. Christ will come. He will return. That's the blessed hope. 
He will return in glory as a warrior and king, and he will defeat the beast and the false prophet. He will defeat the kings of the earth and their armies, and they will all be cast into the lake of fire. History is ever moving toward those climactic events, which means it is moving toward increasingly difficult times, but ultimately victorious days. That may be near. I think we should look for it and hope for it. It may be near, but they may be far as well. It may be far off. We don't know when the Lord is coming and when that day of victory will come. What is certain is that in these days the opposition is present and it is strong. So we should be arming ourselves to resist it and preparing ourselves for hard times. How do we do that? Well, I think you know exactly what I'm going to say. We do that by avidly studying God's Word and by avoiding the, the dangers of this world, the spirit of this age, the love of self and money and pleasure. Uh, though, that is a strong and delusive Spirit. It's what Paul refers to in Romans 12, verse 2, when, uh, with his warning against being conformed to this world. Uh, the, the pressure to do that is always present, always on us, and it is a strong pressure. But Paul also said that our minds are being transformed, renewed and changed as we as we, so that we can offer ourselves to the Lord as a holy and a living and holy sacrifice. That occurs through the study of God's Word and obedience to that. It disabuses us of a desire for the things of, of the world and, and gives us a desire for the things of God. That sanctification, that is the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in making us holy, making us like Christ. And it happens through the study of Scripture and as a result of that, through fellowship and worship with the saints. Through all of that, He increasingly makes us Christ-like. He makes us wise and helpful, makes us useful. And that's what He told the Corinthians. Through the Word of God... We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. That is, into the image of Christ from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18. That's an amazing statement, a magnificent statement. So make it your desire to know the Lord. That's how our love for Him increases and our desire for the world decreases. It, it is how we are equipped for hard times and days of conflict. We all need that desire. And to make that effort. But if you're here without Christ, your first need is to believe in Him. You are lost without Him. You are weighed down with sin. You may feel the crushing burden of guilt. He can remove that. He will remove that. So come to the cross. Come to Christ. Look to Him. Trust in Him who died for sinners and gives salvation to all who do that. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. May God help you to do that. And help all of us to take up arms, as it were, in this spiritual battle and know that we are going to triumph. Let's end with uh, hymn number seven in the Songs of Praise book, Be Thou My Vision. Let's stand and sing it and then remain standing for the benediction. Number seven. Lord, we do ask for a clear and deep vision of you, of our triune God. Give us that vision and the motivation to live for you. That vision is found in your word. Give us a hunger for it, obedience to it, and service for you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Warren. Amen.